Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, what the Treasurer will cut to pay for the budget surplus. The Egyptian elections get off to a promising start, but what are the long-term hopes for democracy there? And have Australians been lying about how many hours they work? Our panel tonight, James Carlton from Radio National Breakfast, Jessica Brown from the Centre for Independent Studies, and in Canberra, economics correspondent for The Age, and the Sydney Morning Herald, Peter Martin. And you can join in on Twitter using the hashtag the drum. Well, the federal government is promising the budget will be back in the black by next year, but are we swinging the axe to get there? The Treasurer released his mid-year economic outlook today, revealing a blowout in the deficit to more than $37 billion for this financial year. Global financial events and natural disasters are being blamed. It means the forecast surplus has been more than halved to $1.5 to, to $1 billion for 2012-13. And to reach that figure, the government will embark on a savings drive worth $11 billion over four years, including cuts to the public service. We are in, a, in tight fiscal circumstances and it's the government's judgment that government has to play uh, its part, tighten its belt, uh, and government, uh, the public service, has to continue to make a contribution to delivering savings. The decision the government has made is that from the 1st of July an additional 2.5 per cent efficiency dividend will apply to agencies. This is on top of the existing 1.5 per cent that has previously uh, been put in place. This results in savings of about $1.5 billion over the forward estimates. There will be a crackdown on the living away from home allowance for foreign workers and higher charges for some visas. The baby bonus will also be trimmed, bringing it down from $5,000 from September next year. And the opposition leader is accusing Labor of targeting families. This is a, a rip-off of the forgotten families of Australia. Uh, let's not forget that the baby bonus uh, uh, is there to help stay-at-home mums. Uh, and I think this is a government which has uh, never had much respect for the stay-at-home mums of Australia. And we'll take your tweets on this issue. Jess, what do you make of uh, reducing the baby, baby, baby bonus from $5,437 to, to $5,000? Um, look, I think it's a good move and I support it. I don't think it is as significant as it's being made out to be. Um, I really think if you look at all the cuts we've seen, really their efficiency dividends, they're closing loopholes, it's trying to find, bring forward savings. Um, the baby bonus is really the only spending program that's been cut and it looks to me like they've said we've got to come up with something that's going to make headlines to make us look really tough and that's what they've done the baby bonus it's going to save 90 million dollars next year it's not significant in the context of this whole package um, and it's not even that significant in the context of the baby bonus this is taking it back to the level it was in in 2009 so I think they're going to be really happy with the way this is playing out because tomorrow morning on the front page of the tabloids the headlines going to be baby bonus slashed and it plays right in with Labor's narrative that they are um, fiscal conservatives. I think, I think it, it's a tactical move almost. Peter, should they have been tougher on the baby bonus? That, that's what the government's doing. It's um, talking tough without being tough. But where I think we disagree is I don't think they should be tough. Not at the moment. And uh, that's why what they've done is really, uh, I suppose, OK, because uh, it they haven't done too much damage. They've got the surplus, uh, a lot of these spending measures are good ones, a lot of it shuffling spending from one year to another, but uh, if they went all out to get a surplus they'll be able to deliver, I'm not too sure they'll be able okay. to deliver okay. the uh, wafer-thin surplus, that could do the economy damage at the moment with we'll, everything that's we'll, happening We'll overseas. talk more about the surplus issue in a moment, Peter, but just to stick with some of the cuts, James, any political implications for that cut to the baby bonus? Well, it's, well, I suppose it'll be up to parents who have a baby and get uh, $5,000 instead of $5,400. Maybe they'll be upset by it. We'll wait and see. But the point is, what's the motivation behind it? It's clearly political rather than uh, economic, you know, the desire to get to a surplus. It just so happens to be before uh, the, the next election, in the final budget, before the, the, the next election, so they can say they've delivered one. But, you know, the, it, it's a political move, not an economic one. James, probably the biggest announcement is really the efficiency drive within the public service. Uh, they've uh, called on another 2.5% across most government departments, on top of the 1.5% that was announced in May. So that's now 4%. That's, that's going to cost jobs in the public sector. Well, if it doesn't cost jobs, it'll certainly result in a worsening of service delivery. Anyone who's had the trauma of having to apply for an old age 
pension or unemployment benefits and having to wait in those Centrelink queues, you'll be remembering that fondly because the queues are going to get bigger. It's a difficult, it's an easy way out for the government. They say, oh, we'll have an efficiency dividend without having to stomach up to the decision of having to make cuts. Um, you know, 4% efficiency dividend now, can we do what we do as a, in a household with 4% income, the same level of consumption? And what happens when there's a downturn over the next six months? Uh, are we going to lift the 8% efficiency, efficiency dividend? It, it, I don't think there's much of a rationale public service-wise behind it. Peter, the increase of the efficiency dividend is a, a broken promise from the last election, but is it good policy? It may well be. It's for one year only, by the way, and guess what? That happens to be the surplus year, 12-13. Uh, uh, yes, it's tough, um, but for one year only, <laughs> the year they need to get the, uh, the cosmetic surplus, uh, perhaps it can be lived with. The difference is that the coalition, and they, they had their own uh, efficiency dividend in the election, they were going to freeze public service hiring. In fact, that was to be ongoing for uh, the, the entire term of, of government. So possibly it can be lived with. It, it, it'll be painful for the departments, but uh, it really depends on how they, ma how they manage it. And it, if it had gone on for three years, which is what the coalition uh, was going to do, you'd see an entire cohort, almost an educational generation of graduates who wouldn't get jobs in the Treasury, wouldn't get jobs in the public service. So, uh, uh, if you like, uh, if there had been a, a hiring freeze, uh, uh, say the Treasury's forecast are left, they wouldn't be able to replace them. Uh, this will uh, hurt for a year and uh, then the pressure will be released. Happens to be the year they want a surplus. Uh, Jess, your thoughts on the efficiency dividend? Uh, look, I don't think it's such a bad thing at all. I mean, the public service grows year after year, so winding it back a little bit, um, I think, is probably not so much of a problem. Um, but I think James makes a very good point in saying it's almost a lot easier to do this politically than to actually go through line by line and mm. say which programs you're going to cut. But I think that... you're kind of handing responsibility exactly. over to someone else, Exactly, aren't you? exactly. But I think that method, the line by line method, is probably a better one. What you ultimately want to do is improve the quality of spending. Um, and, and that really does involve going through and saying which programs don't we need. It's not about cutting frontline jobs. It's about getting rid of the programs that are unneeded. And, and James, Penny Wong now has a new section in her department called the Efficient improvement branch. Now, they'd be worth putting an FOI into uh, look at their expense account, wouldn't they? Well, I tell you, I, with the Telegraph I was reading and it revealed that uh, a man by the name of Dr Jim Forbes from the history books yeah. was receiving the gold pass. He was a Menzies minister. <laughs> I'd assumed he was dead yeah, 30 years he's, ago. He's apologies, 87. Apologies to the Forbes family. He's, not only is he still alive, he's still flying at uh, first class domestically at public expense. Maybe that's something the department could look at. OK, well, the Gillard government uh, promised the service and it says that will be delivered, though it will be smaller than originally anticipated. The Treasurer says it's a matter of national pride. At a time of heightened global instability, our fiscal discipline here needs to send a message to the world. And that is precisely what we are doing by bringing the budget back to surplus in 2012-13. We are showcasing to the world the strong economic fundamentals of the Australian economy. But Greens leader Bob Brown has questioned the need to achieve a surplus at any cost and he says there are better ways to get back into the black. If a surplus has to be achieved, let's take it from the short-term wealth base of this country rather than cutting into the long-term wealth base, which is uh, the intellectual capital you get from pop properly funding an education system. And the opposition claims the surplus won't happen at all. S surplus, this supposed surplus, Nick, it's a hoax. It is a hoax. And it is, uh, it is a part of the, the sort of political trickery that I think people are getting well and truly sick of. Yes, that what the Labor Party is doing is it's fiddling the numbers to give the appearance of a budget surplus, a budget surplus that is beyond the realm of possibility when you look at what the Labor Party actually does and not what they say. So, Peter, is this uh, the budget surplus achievable? I mean, we're talking about a forecast of a $1.5 billion surplus, and that's uh, less than half what was predicted just six months ago. Will they get there? Oh. 
<laughs> so hard to say. <laughs> look, uh, look, look, uh, on my family's uh, income, and uh, we, we're not a, a terribly well-off family, you'd be talking of a difference of uh, $90 or so, <laughs> whether you'd spent more or less. I, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, now, if everything goes right, and uh, this is what the OECD forecasts released this week are based on. They call it the muddling through scenario. If nothing goes wrong internationally, there's not a single extra piece of bad news. Who knows? They might get 1.5 billion. The Treasury has modelled what might happen if things go wrong. And uh, one of uh, the uh, downside scenarios it has, which is a, a further loss in Australia's terms of trade, uh, prices we pay for things and prices we get for things, a further loss of 4%. If that happens, they say uh, it'll cut the surplus, cut the 1.5 billion surplus by 6.6 .6 billion. That's four times the cut. So this is wafer thin. And of course, in reality, it makes no difference, uh, as in, uh, as in uh, your own income, Steve, whether you uh, in one year happen to spend a, a little bit more than you earn or happen to spend a little bit less. It is uh, symbolic, as, uh, as the opposition uh, So, said. Peter, why are you questioning uh, the wisdom of, of this push for the surplus? It's a very uncertain time, and we, 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 uh, internationally, very uncertain. The, the, the report that came out from the OECD is uh, uh, a bit hair-raising, uh, actually. Even their best-case scenario. Wayne Swan uh, said today, echoing that report, that we have Europe turning down at the same time as the US is turning down. Japan's not looking too good either. Now, in that situation, Australians are saving rather than spending, saving as they haven't done for 20 or so years. Um, employers are not hiring as they once were. This is very sensible behaviour. Now, it's not the sort of situation in which you want to drop big spending cuts or big tax increases because that'll just put, uh, push people more and more into their shells. In time, those will be needed. Now probably isn't the time. And fortunately, they haven't really made big cuts. A lot of this is just shuffling money from one year to the other. Jess, you think it's a good idea to go for surplus, don't you? I do, I do. Um, look, I think, I think Peter's right in that it's pretty optimistic. I mean, look at the global economy. We can't predict what's going to happen next week, um, let alone next year. So we really don't know. Um, and with so much volatility, um, they'll be lucky if they get there. But I think it's an important goal to go for. And I take almost the other view, which is because because of the volatility that we know is coming, because we know that we're probably going to get dragged down by this Eurozone crisis, the time to get our house in order is now. Um, there's a real danger of saying, OK, well, it's only a small surplus now, um, but next year it's going to get worse, it'll be a bit, bigger, a bit bigger the year after. That's the sort of thinking that started Europe and the US on, on the train that they're on now, and they're, they have these huge deficits that they can't get their way out of. But James, Labor's boxed, us, boxed itself in here, haven't they? It's it has become about their reputation. Exactly. We're, our house in Australia is already in order. We're in the nicest house in the nicest street in the nicest suburb. Uh, double brick for clues. The, the, this, <laughs> of the 30 uh, countries, I think it's something like 30 countries have been given a triple A credit rating from all the agencies. Of them, their de government debt to uh, GDP ratio is double Australia's on average. So we're the best of the best. So and against this, we have a $1.5 billion surplus in a $1.5 trillion economy. It's clearly political. P Peter, what about the accounting methods being used here? The opposition seem to be saying there's some creative accounting going on to get this surplus. What do you think? <laughs> They're absolute shockers. They really are. Look, they've moved uh, $1 billion of spending out of the surplus year. Uh, a lot of this is uh, flood spending and so on into this year. They just happened to need to do the spending earlier. Mr Swan uh, suggested that was a uh, coincidence, uh, fortuitous. Um, perhaps so. Uh, we know in the budget uh, they're paying out the compensation for the carbon uh, price, which comes in uh, in uh, July next year. They're paying out uh, billions of dollars of compensation in the financial year before to get it out of, out of the surplus year. There's uh, line after line where you can see even the efficiency dividend, which just happens to come in in the year they're aiming for a surplus, they've uh, either introduced revenue raising measures in that year or moved spending into this year. And that's one of the reasons why this year's deficit is, uh, will be, on their forecast, 15 billion worse, uh, larger, than it was going to be. Uh, there's an awful lot of that. I suppose it does no harm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Well, while our government is talking about a return to surplus, in other parts of the world they're trying to stop their econ economies from going backwards. The latest OECD forecast is pretty grim, warning the Eurozone could be heading into recession, with Britain and, and America not far behind. I believe we can define this a critical moment. The situation in the Euro area is rapidly deteriorating and contagion is spreading. Policy continues to be behind the curve, not only in the Euro area, also in the United States. So we think that swift and decisive action is needed to avoid the worst. When President Obama met with European Union leaders at the White House, one issue dominated the discussion, how to stop the contagion spreading any further. Europe is having difficulties then it's much more difficult for us to create good jobs here at home because we send so many of our products uh, and services to Europe. It is such an important uh, trading partner for us. The OECD says Australia will have the fastest growth rate in the developed world next year at 4 per cent, equaled only by Chile. Peter, if, if Australia's growth rate is uh, forecast to be so good next year, is that a counter-argument to what you're saying? Maybe we can uh, afford to, to go back into surplus. Well, it's been wound down quite a bit uh, from what it was. That 4% OECD forecast, which is for the calendar year uh, 2012, actually equates to the forecast here of uh, three and a quarter percent for the two financial years either side. The, the forecasts are in sync, and they're worse than they were. Now. Uh, on any measure, our economy is doing okay. We'll probably, compared to the, compared to the rest of the developed world, we'll probably keep doing okay because, uh, compared to the rest of the developed world, because even if the US turns down, and Obama was talking about Europe there, but uh, the OECD report is very worried. Uh, about the US, particularly worried that the US, you remember that debate they had over the debt ceiling, just won't spend enough because of their, their uh, political uh, situation in a presidential election uh, coming up in the next year. Um, even if Europe gets really bad, China's economy has uh, moved along. It's, it's a lot further uh, along than it was uh, in the, uh, I suppose, GFC1. Uh, to the point where there are now a lot of consumers in China, people who have come from the country into the cities, who are buying Chinese products. So even if Europe and uh, the US, their demand turns down, demand in China and also North Asia, Korea, uh, they buy and sell things from each other, should probably look after us. Yes, we're clearly better off than the other countries. It's not, not <laughs> anything to do with our own good management or our own good work, really. It's to do with uh, good fortune. Uh, but uh, things are worse than they were. And, and Peter, do you think it increases the likelihood, these kind of figures, that um, the Eurozone may break up? Um, many people say that they're not sure how it can stay together. Of course, on, on a level in the street, it's very difficult. I mean, think of it in, in Australia. Australia is a common currency area. We all have dollars. Now, how would you uh, draw a line in Australia and break it up with, say, to the West Australians, your uh, <laughs> dollar coin is now worth uh, more? and the, the rest of you is now worth less and you're going to swap it over for something without people moving borders. Uh, it's never been done before really undoing a currency area. Or mm. All that's happened before is creating one. Um, uh, but uh, that sort of thing or uh, Germany uh, accepting that it needs no longer to uh, have, if you like, uh, different and more restrictive policies than the rest of Europe uh, may well have to happen. Australia can do it. We can have a common currency because we have a united political system. They'll have to either go for a united economic management, which we'll see if you like the well-managed countries uh, uh, subsidise the others, or uh, uh, people are talking about a, a breakup of the euro, yes. Well, moving on to other issues now. And the Labor Party is getting together for its national conference at the end of the week. But the push to give greater voting powers to rank and file members has already begun. Leading the charge for democracy is former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, the leader made and then brought undone by the so-called faceless men of the factions. He argues there are 35,000 forgotten members who don't have any real say in the big decisions. But when Jenny McAllister was returned to the ALP national presidency over the weekend, only about a third of those eligible to vote actually bothered. James, what does this say about the thirst for democracy within the ALP? It says it's very difficult to apply the medicine of reform when the patient appears to be a corpse because uh, we got the situation where 
Faulkner had his review with Carr and Brax, and they said we're in a major crisis. 35,000 people uh, are in the party. Julia Gillard says that's unsustainable. We need to have a membership drive of 8,000. 10,000 people cast a vote in the ALP ballot. 10,000. That means three out of four members of the Labor Party either are so disillusioned and so dispassionate about their membership that they couldn't be bothered to put a stamp on the envelope. Or they may not be real people, James. Or they're, or they're <laughs> phantoms, or they're stacks who didn't know what the letter was. They were just hopeful it didn't come from the Department of Immigration. This is the situation the party is in. It's a, and people say, oh, but this is what happens with uh, institutions across the, the world, with social democratic parties. It's not. As recently as 15 years ago, you could go to Labor Party branches, which had 200 members in areas covering a few suburbs. Now in New South Wales, a state of... 7 million people, there are literally 3,000 active members of the Labor Party left. And it speaks to the uh, diabolical situation the party faces itself at this weekend's national conference. Very, very dire. Jess, um, could it just be the position that they don't care about? Or is it you know, re truly representative of uh, democracy within the ALP? Um, oh, probably a, bit, a little bit of both. I mean, we've spoken before about the, I suppose, crisis of identity within the ALP. Are they a workers' party? Are they a progressive party? They don't really seem to know what they are. And I actually think that this issue of the structure of the ALP goes to the heart of that, because I don't think rank-and-file members or Labor supporters feel like their voice is being listened to on this at all. There needs to be a conversation about what is the identity of the ALP. And the only way to do that is to involve all of these people in it. And it doesn't look like that's happening. It's, everything's being so stage managed. Well, uh, moving on to another issue now. We might have been the first country to secure an, an eight-hour day, but most Australians now pride themselves on being amongst the hardest workers in the world. But are we really putting in that much time at the office? A new study by the Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research says the idea that Australians work more hours than others is absolute crap. And people in Japan and Korea have it tougher. In fact, the research has found the percentage of Australians working long hours had actually fallen over the past 10 years. Peter Martin, what do you think about this, uh, this report? Does it suggest that Australians have been lying about how many hours they work in a week? No, I think it suggests they're economically rational. You see, r wages, real wages, have been increasing in Australia uh, for the last decade, increasing quite a lot, uh, by the way. Now, um, the, uh, the Institute, uh, Jessica and other people might say, gee, that'll make people work harder. Well, maybe, but it also means that you actually uh, have less need uh, to work hard in order to get the income you need. And uh, this is called an income effect uh, in this case versus a prices effect. And I think that's what we're seeing. I think we're seeing an income effect. We're, we're, we're seeing that people don't need to get the promotion, which has with it the longer hours that they once thought they might have uh, needed. Uh, we're seeing them make perfectly rational trade-offs and, of course, uh, working part-time uh, where they can, perfectly rational trade-off between uh, leisure and money and uh, I think it's the uh, increased incomes which have increased. Uh, and maybe when, maybe when unemployment is only... And maybe when unemployment is only 5%, you don't need to impress the boss as much by hanging around. Jess, what do you make of uh, Peter's analysis well, there? I actually agree with Peter. Um, if you have a look, Australians, full-time Australians do work long hours compared to the average. We're also among the highest paid in the world, so it makes sense. But our rate of part-time work is almost double the OECD average. So Australia's flexible labour market means that we have a lot of choice about the number of hours that we work. But I, I love these studies when you see these studies that show Australians work too hard, we work too hard. And the questions are always things like, would you like to work less hours? Which is the stupidest <laughs> question in the world. It's like saying, would you like less money? No one, you know, you know what the answer is going to be. You can't take them too seriously. So I actually think this is a really good study to just put all of those on their head. James, you started work at 5 a.m. this morning. You're still going, so obviously you're you're part of the um, you know beating out the average of the hours here. What, what do you make Certainly. of this study? Look, all this uh, the, the talk of a rational decision um, is all good and well, and for the m people in the economy who, who who have the ability to make these judgments uh, uh, and come and have them come to fruition, good luck to them. There are many people in the economy, however, who work terribly long hours and wish they could work less, but they can't. There are many people who work too few hours. They want to work more, but they can't get the extra hours. So uh, that's a matter that almost needs to be borne in mind and isn't easily or readily uh, measured by uh, these aggregate figures. Peter, what about the issue, though, of um, you know, smartphones, technology, email? It seems like people, a lot of people think that they're working on their weekends when they don't want to be. The Australia Institute has pro, uh, proposed a uh, 
contact-free day where people don't turn on their smartphones, don't do that sort of thing. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, their announcement about this said, uh, beware of gifts from the boss. Don't you think the boss is nice giving you that, uh, that uh, iPhone or iPad or something like that? Aren't they generous? Look, I use mine on, on the bus to work uh, all of the time. Uh, the only time uh, I'm not connected is uh, if I cycle to work. Um, having said that, uh, I think this, this way of working probably has more advantages than disadvantages for the people doing it because the, 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 uh, the survey showed that the people do a lot of work Sunday nights, right? they check their email, get ready for the, uh, the week. Where you're in jobs where you do that, you usually have a bit of flexibility. So if you want to go uh, to uh, the school concert uh, in the morning or something like that, uh, the boss understands that uh, you're already putting in far more than the required hours uh, out of work and you can do it. So for a, a, a lot of people don't mind being tr uh, chained to the, uh, uh, the job as they are, I don't. Jess, that's a good point Peter makes there too. There is that more flexibility you see in workplaces now. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think this is something that we're seeing as the economy changes and, and, and as this technology changes. Um, one thing the Australian Labor Force really has going for it is the flexibility. A lot of these other countries that have fewer working hours than Australia on average have much more rigid systems. Australia's got much more flexibility. So you can choose if you want to have this type of job. And, and as we were saying, these, these are tend to be highly paid people who have more flexibility, more ability to choose. I don't think this is such a bad thing at all. Okay, uh, coming up next on the drum, can the historic elections in Egypt deliver a workable democracy? We're going to talk to academic and Egyptian Australian Farid Farid. That's next. Saturday, the mysterious deaths of Simon Amos and James Annette, isolated on a remote Kimberley station and given responsibility beyond their 17 years. They became lost and stranded before disappearing into the great sandy desert. Here we have two young fellas just disappeared off the face of the earth overnight. From even the police force were not terribly interested. Chris Masters' original 1987 investigation, Saturday night on ABC News 24. Qantas planes may be back in the air, but thousands of passengers are still facing lengthy delays. Indonesian police say the boat was carrying around 70 people when it hit rough seas near Java. Wake up to all the overnight news and headlines with the team at ABC News Breakfast with hosts Michael Rowland and Virginia Trioli. Get the latest sports results with Paul Kennedy. And Vanessa O'Hanlon has the local and global weather. ABC News Breakfast, a smarter start to your day. Weekdays at 6. Hello, I'm Andrew Robertson. Coming up on the finance quarter, Generation Y. They're the future, they're potentially brilliant, but they're different. How smart bosses can get the best out of them. That's the finance quarter after the drum. Millions of Egyptians have headed to the polls to cast the vote, uh, their votes in the nation's first elections since the fall of Hosni Mubarak. So far it's been a relatively peaceful affair. Fears of unrest have not deterred locals with voting lines of up to several kilometres long forming throughout the country. Fareed Fareed is a PhD candidate at the Centre for Cultural Research at the University of Western Sydney. He's been following the elections in Egypt and he joins us now. Fareed, welcome back to The Drum. Thanks Steve. So tell us about um, you know, the elections so far. A success given how peaceful it's been? Yeah, I think it's uh, success. How do we judge success? It's mm. interesting. If you're a Western or international observer, by all means, yes. There has been no logistical irregularities or very few in terms of ballot boxes from years of endemic corruption to relatively peaceful marches um, and, you know, lines of women extending in even well-to-do areas of Cairo. Um, so, and in Alexandria, for example, there's been a huge turnout from the diaspora, it's a historic um, landmark elections because it's the first time that the Egyptian diaspora, nearly 8 million, have had the right to vote. Now, the website for registering has had a lot of complications, a lot of irregularities. But for first elections, um, yes, it is truly historic because we have multi-party uh, multi candidates fielding themselves as well as independents. And the word independent is actually quite new within the Egyptian political lexicon. So yes, but 
against the backdrop of violence last week, mm. we have to be sort of cautious of what do we mean by success. So the people you've been talking to back in Egypt, what have they been saying to you? Yeah, I think it's uh, trepidatious because they know that this is the first time um, that government will be formed without the shadow of Hosni Mubarak looming. Right? So there's that sense of trepidatiousness, but also there's a sense of optimism that for the first time we're Egyptians, we're out there, we know that the polls won't be, um, you know, uh, f there won't be that electoral fraud that has marked so many elections. And they're uh, confident of that? Yeah, I think so, because the d uh, judiciary has been overseeing that. Yet, you have thousands and thousands in Tahrir who have boycotted the elections yeah. because of the violence that has preceded it. So these are the, it depends who you're talking to in the Egyptian sector. Within my family itself, you know, they split down the middle. Some are boycotting, including myself, some aren't, you know. So why are you boycotting? I'm boycotting because of the violence that led up to the elections and because of the military... And because of what caused the violence? And what caused the violence and the military transi uh, transition towards a democratic system of elections hasn't been forthright. They have been uh, putting out very vacuous rhetoric, uh, rhetorical statements of we will ensure a democratic transition. The United States, uh, for example, has been supporting that the EU. But on the ground preceding the elections, there's been rubber bullets fired. There's been tear gas canisters that have been expired since the 80s fired on Egyptian scissors. Now, I don't think that's the best scenario leading up to a peaceful democratic election. And, and what has led up to that, of course, is the, the military being unwilling to, uh, to see power. Exactly. to the parliament. Is, is there any chance that that could change when this new parliament is elected? I have to choose my words carefully here because on a daily basis, we, even within the military apparatus as a political organism, it changes, it flip-flops between choosing these so-called candidates who will um, uh, fulfil the democratic uh, wills of the people, but then they resort back to old ex-NDP members, the National Democratic Party, which was ironically the term for Hosni Mubarak's party. So now the interim Prime Minister, Kamal al Ganzuri, actually was the Prime Minister during Mubarak's time from 95 to 99. Him coming back into the fold of power shows me that the military is unwilling to give up that sense of power. Now, this isn't just culturally uh, symptomatic of the region, but, I mean, we've seen it in other dictatorships, uh, military dictatorships in South America, for example. Well, let's rewind a bit and explain to us the, the, the role of the military and what they said about the constitution and their power and how they would override the parliament. What, what did they lay, out, lay down before all of this happened? Definitely. OK, so circulating amongst the parties that didn't want to boycott the elections, a few parties did, like the Egyptian Communist Party, who have had a proud history, and that's been documented in academic papers. But of the parties... The independent parties that uh, supported the military supra-constitutional charter, there was an article within it that specified that the military has this extra-constitutional power to intervene at any time, even though there would be a civilian government. Now, most of the parties boycotted that, but a majority of the parties as well stood by, including, emphatically, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, supported this supra-constitutional article, even though a lot of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, young uh, cadres went out into the protest on the 18th of November. The Muslim Brotherhood, for example, has been less than forthcoming about its political ideals. You know, some of its spokespeople have come out and said, we've been waiting for 80 years. Well, it's not just the Muslim Brotherhood, it's other independent political voices on the Egyptian landscape. Um, there's a lot of anxiety in Western press about the Muslim Brotherhood yeah, and sure. what it might mean. My sense, looking at other um, Muslim democracies, is that Islamist parties in a democratic system have tended to liberalise. They've tended to move to the centre just because that's what you need to do to, to get a lot of to votes. Get votes yes. um, I mean, what, do you think this is what would happen, or are you worried also about what the Brotherhood could stand for? I don't think... Uh, people are worried in terms of the Islamist rhetoric that's coming out. Rightly so, because there's been the Salafist mm. influences, but they're different from the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. The Freedom and Justice Party, the political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood, have followed in the same footsteps 
um, of, for example, in Nahda, in Tunisia, Morocco, um, first time in 75 years an Islamist-led party will be joining parliament uh, through a coalition. There will always be a coalition. Mm. And the coalition in any democracy, if it will be truly a functioning democracy, will hold the Muslim Brotherhood to accountability. Mm. Where there are fears is their relationships, not towards Israel or Iran or so on, is the relationships towards the members and a sense of democracy within the party itself because they haven't been participating in the latest sit-ins, the latest protests. Pro Tahrir Square has moved away from supporting the older elites of the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's not just the Muslim Brotherhood, it's other independent parties, such as al waf for example, who have been a leftist party. But I think what's happening in Egypt is you see a generational clash. So even the elites of all of the other parties didn't participate in Tahrir Square and other towns in Egypt. They're the ones that are being left out in this push for democracy. But all that will be fixed by democracy, you know. I mean, the, the, the West may, uh, in its um, you know, naivety, confuse the Salafists with the Muslim Brotherhood, yes. but Egyptians don't. Every Egyptian knows the difference, and every Egyptian knows that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood has for 30 years um, opposed violence, uh, has supported, oh, yes. has oh, supported a, um, a mainstream, democratic, secular state. Mubarak, am I right in saying, was opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood and crushed the Muslim Brotherhood not because he was a secularist but because he was a dictator. Completely. The divide and rule tactic which is still being used by the military we've seen it's either the majority or the minority so it was used against Islamist cadres now it's being used against leftists against other minorities such as the cops and so on which happened at Maspira a month ago. What's happening with the Muslim Brotherhood is the internal political mechanisms as something to be watched. It's not something to be feared, not in terms of violence or whatever, but like as he said before, there will be a transition even because you're in government for the first time and as they, in their words we've been waiting for this. The sense of governance um, and their policies will have to shift and adapt especially with regards of uh, foreign policy in the region. Well, the events leading up to um, the election advantage the Muslim Brotherhood when it comes to votes, given that they were very highly organised in getting their people out to vote, yet at the same time all the violence was going on in Tahrir Square. A lot of people were, like yourself, boycotting the elections or focused on what was going on there, whereas the Muslim Brotherhood, it seems, have been highly organised still and getting out their people to vote. But they've lost a lot of support within the Egyptian political mainstream precisely because they didn't participate, the older, I'm talking about the older generation of the elites who are the policy makers within the Freedom and Justice Party, um, they didn't participate in the latest sit-ins. They've always been taking a line of not criticising SCAF or the Supreme Council of Armed Forces too much. The only thing that they protested within the supra-constitutional charter was a civil and democratic secular state which they wanted to change the meanings of and leave civil to open interpretations. They wanted to take it out, right? Um, yet they didn't protest the article about there being constitutional powers granted to SCAF. That, for the Muslim Brotherhood, has lost a lot of support leading up to the elections. But the overseas vote, especially in Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, uh, having nearly 750,000 who voted, who participated in that, overwhelmingly will be supporting the Muslim Brotherhood and so on. So Fred, we've seen the first day of the election. Yes. This process goes for four months. I yeah, pretty Explain much. to us how come it takes so long. Okay, so two houses. This is the lower house. What they're voting for today is 166 seats. In two weeks, and that's only four governorates today. Um, in two weeks' time, another seven governorates will be entering the fray. And then there's another house, Maglis Shura, um, and that'll be the Consultative Council. That will be in January, January 3rd, and then towards the end of January. So they'll be splitting it up in terms of governorates because of a huge population. And then towards April, we will f ha finally have the presidential elections, and that's when we'll start hearing yeah, um, names like uh, Amr Musa, the former uh, Arab League secretary, and of course Mohammed al-Baradai, who has been quiet on the political scene.
Um, are you optimistic that this process will lead to democracy and that it's going to go all the way through? Or You've only, you only got 20 seconds free to answer that. I'm a Pez optimist, always <laughs> with all that, definitely. OK, we'll have to leave our Pez optimist there. That's all for the drum for tonight. Thanks very much to the panel, uh, James Carlton, Jessica Brown and Peter Martin. And thanks very much to our guest, Fareed Fareed. You can check out the website at abc.net.au forward slash the drum. And we'll see you the same time tomorrow night.